Hi. Um, I'd, I'd like to thank the whole NEJS comp team. You guys have done a, just a great job. Uh, I'm really excited to be here. My name is Beth Hobart, and I am going to talk to you about serverless applications. More specifically, what the fuck are they and how you can use them. So I'm going to set the tone first. You are a front-end dev, and you need to make a website for a small business client. It seems pretty straightforward. They are a brick-and-mortar shop that sells cat accessories. OK, you're supposed to laugh. <laughs> who, who sells cat accessories? I don't know. I mean, it could be a real thing. OK, so they want a simple site that lists their location and hours, et cetera. So you start building a static site. Makes sense, right? And then they send you an email saying, oh, and we also want the, the site to display any kittens that are currently available nearby. So all of a sudden, you're like, how am I going to get these kittens to display? This is a static site. Well, not anymore. <laughs> um, you're going to have to make an API call. And because of course, you can't make a request from the client side, your static site, without some really hacky solution that might not even work. So now you need to build a website with server-side functionality. So what about cross-origin resource sharing? So some of you probably know about this. So browsers restrict cross-origin HTTP requests initiated from within scripts. So you're still unable to hit that third-party API, even if you're using some kind of XHR, AJAX, or fetch call to make that HTTP, HTTP request to the third-party API with JavaScript. So you're kind of fucked. So now what? OK, so how would most front-end devs solve this problem? Well, there are a few options, right? You could go with WordPress. You could spin up a server on a provider like DigitalOcean. You could tell the customer you won't do it. But let's say that's not an option because you really want that lifetime 20% discount they're offering on Cat Apparel. <laughs> so none of those are ideal solutions. If you go the WordPress route, you're going to end up with lots of unneeded code, hosting costs, maintenance issues, security patches. And on top of that, once your client sees there's an admin panel, they're going to start changing crap and break some shit. <laughs> OK, so that's not ideal. Uh, what about a virtual server like DigitalOcean? You're going to end up with a lot of the same problems you'd have on a WordPress site. Costs, security issues, a server designed for more than you're actually using it for. Plus, now you need to learn a server-side language and have some DevOps knowledge. And both of those, I think, are overkill, not to mention just plain hard to do. And they're pushing the, the limits of your capabilities and taking away time from what you really want to do, which is make money doing kick-ass front-end work. So what if I told you there's a better way? No unwieldy frameworks, no DevOps knowledge required, and you'll only need to use a language that you already know, JavaScript. It's a little thing I like to call serverless. I did not make this up, I wish. <laughs> so you, you probably heard it referenced in many different ways. Functions as a service, backend as a service, cloud functions, Azure, or the infamous AWS Lambda. So, what I'm about to talk to you about is just a small part of serverless. Like With serverless architecture, you can, you can do a lot of things. You can still have a database for persisted data. You can have as much functionality as with most other types of architecture. But what I'm about to show you strips away all of the excess, and you won't need to use an unwieldy framework. You won't even need to use React, just plain old JavaScript. And there, like I said, there are so many use cases. But I'm going to talk about one in particular. So maybe you want to build an application that displays the current movies and the Rotten Tomato scores uh, for a theater nearby. You can hit a movie database API for that, right? Or you want a personal site that shows the current data for stocks you own. You can hit a stock market API. Or you have a client and they're a hairstylist, and they want people to be able to send them messages to make an appointment, but they don't want to share their phone number. You can stand up a simple single-page site that sends messages through the Twilio API. So you see a trend here? API, API, API. <laughs> All of these are single-page websites, 
And calling them applications is barely appropriate. If you just need one API call, serverless is a great option. Well, I still don't know what that means you're saying. What is serverless? Well, I'm going to tell you because that's the name of this talk. Serverless doesn't actually mean no servers. It means servers only when you need them. So when you're building a very simple, minimally dynamic site, like the ones we talked about before, instead of spinning up a droplet on DigitalOcean or a whole new WordPress instance, you spin up a serverless site instead. The server's not actually doing anything until your site needs to hit the API. And a serverless computing service like AWS Lambda takes your functions as input, performs logic, returns your output, and then it shuts completely down. It's done. Until the next time someone visits the site and triggers that API call again, and then it starts all over. This is kind of what it looks like. So you've got your client, and you really want your, your client side, and you really want them to hit, be able to hit that third party API. They can't because of cores. So now you can add in AWS Lambda right up there in the corner. I have a pointer, but I guess I can't point at those big ones, huh? Um, so in this diagram, you could replace AWS Lambda with WordPress or DigitalOcean, but either way, you've added a huge piece of architecture for a really tiny purpose. Uh, the traditional solutions that front-end devs use for adding server-side functionality tend to get really bloated, and I think we all know which part of this diagram sucks the most. It rhymes with hey, double poo, mess panda. <laughs> AWS's UX is just farts. It's absolute farts. Um, so what's in it for you? Well, this means that as a front-end developer, you can rapidly build apps that handle production-ready traffic. And you're not going to have to actively manage scaling. You're not going to have to provision servers. You're not going to have to pay for resources that you're not using. All of the server management is taken care of by the serverless computing service you're using. That was a lot of S's. Okay. But you're thinking, but that's so much more complicated than using WordPress or a virtual server. Or maybe you're saying, I can barely log into AWS without getting a headache just from looking at the dashboard. I thought you said I wouldn't need to learn DevOps for this. I have good news. You don't. There is a company out there that actually already did it for you. Um, they're called Netlify, and they released a feature earlier this year called Netlify Functions. Sound familiar? Maybe, maybe not, but functions is a pretty common term in serverless, so it makes sense. So Netlify Functions is a wrapper around AWS Lambda, and all it takes is a config file in your repo. So this is that diagram again, but this time we've added Netlify functions in there. You can see it's solving the biggest pain point from the previous architecture, which is AWS Lambda. And the reason it's solving that pain point is because Netlify's UX is way, way, way better. So cool, I guess, right? Another tool you have to learn how to use. Yeah, but it's, it's actually a really simple tool. I mean. Y'all are JavaScript developers. You're learning a new framework every two weeks anyway, right? Um, <laughs> this is going to be a walk in the park. So like I said, Netlify Functions is a wrapper around AWS Lambda. I will repeat that many times <laughs> today. And you're never going to have to log into the AWS dashboard. You don't even need an AWS account. Your function management is controlled by Netlify, and they do all the setup for you. I'm going to show you with a real-life example, Snowmaha. Snowmaha is a site I built earlier this year. It is a simple single-page website that indicates whether or not it's snowing in Omaha right now. It makes a single HTTP request to a weather API called Dark Sky using Node. The page loads immediately while waiting for the response, and then once the response is received, JavaScript logic on the front end displays snow if it's snowing. Take a look. So this is what it looks like when the page no, uh, loads initially. And then this is what it looks like when it's snowing. <laughs> like that is everything. That's the whole site right there. <laughs> Pretty simple, right? So uh, a lot of people in this room know that I'm actually a Ruby developer by day. 
and you're probably assuming that I used Rails or Sinatra or some other web framework to build the server-side functionality, but I didn't. I use 100% JavaScript, and I'm going to show you how to do it too. There's some boilerplate needed for this. This is the Netlify TOML file, and I think it's the most important part of the setup. The most important part of this file is the setting where your compiled functions are gonna be stored, which is in that functions line right there. So mine are being stored in a functions directory, really original. Uh, all that means is that the little bit of server-side code that I'm writing, meaning the bit that talks to the Dark Sky API, is going to live in a file inside of that functions folder. This is gonna tell Netlify that it should make an AWS Lambda instance for any files that it finds in that folder. So now my job is basically to write, using JavaScript, a simple function that talks to Dark Sky. And I'll leave the server set up in API endpoint creation to Netlify functions, which will deal with AWS Lambda for me. So the Node.js function lives in a file called app.js. You can call it anything. Looks like this, it's my bread and butter of my server side code. You can see the request to dark sky, and then at the bottom, the logic to determine, to determine whether or not it's snowing. The pieces that are specific to Netlify functions are that export handler at the top, and those three um, arguments. So the first two arguments, you don't even need to worry about, Netlify handles those. And then the third argument, the callback argument, is what you would provide, but it's optional, so you don't even need to add it. Um, so remember, we already told Netlify to compile this and prepare an endpoint on Lambda for us. So let me show you where that endpoint goes in our code. It's on my single HTML page. Um, this is my index page, only page on my site. The JavaScript logic and the fetch call are down at the bottom. Don't worry, I have closer images of the code. This is my HTML at the top that when the page loads initially, it shows a simple message that we're waiting for the weather data. And then down at the bottom of my index page, I have my fetch call. So the fetch part is what would have been impossible before. You can't just fetch, the dark, you can't just fetch dark sky directly from the page because of cores. Instead, we're fetching the API endpoint that Netlify is setting up for us. So that endpoint will trigger a Lambda function that talks to dark sky on the server for us. I think it's pretty cool. I mean, it's, Netlify's doing all the hard work for us. So the fetch call is gonna hit that Lambda instance that runs app.js, which we just saw, the server-side code. And remember, in my netlify.toml file, we set the location where our function is stored, which was in the functions directory. And then we added the app.js file to the source directory. So server-side code, and then back on my index page. So this JavaScript is adding and removing certain CSS classes based on what the function returns, and then displaying snow if it's snowing. So that's the code. It's very basic. Now I wanna show you the development process for this, like how you're gonna run the code locally to see if it's actually working. Basically, we wanna be able to visit Snowmaha locally and have it trigger locally a one-off server that talks to Dark Sky for us. So the last thing I'm gonna do is add a couple of scripts for running servers and compiling the Lambda function locally. So it, this is package.json. Package if you're not familiar with it, it's not specific to Netlify functions. It's actually a, a node thing, so you can learn about this by following a basic Node.js tutorial. So with the boilerplate set up, you need the actual Node.js function, and a simple HTML, HTML page that we're gonna alter. And here's my, this diagram again. And this one shows how my commands in package.json are mapping to the different servers locally. So npm start, that one spins up my local server that's gonna run Snowmaha. And then the build, the build functions and start functions commands are compiling and then spinning up a local version of the AWS Lambda function. So I have one tab running in one site. Let's start this little video for you. So in this tab, I'm running the local server. 
and it's opening up a port for me. We need to remember that. And then in my other tab, I'm simulating the Lambda function. So right now I'm building that function, and it's being stored in the correct folder. And then I'm starting up a local dev server and a file watcher for the specified folder. So let's go to those ports and see what happens. So first I'm going to go to the location the function is being served from, and I'm already getting JSON back. That's a really good sign. So if we go to the port where Snowmaha is being <laughs> hosted, <laughs> so it's working. <laughs> I set up a little bit of custom code just for NEJSConf. I didn't want you folks missing out. Um, for those of you who are just visiting Omaha, no, it doesn't actually snow tacos in Omaha. But for some reason, they still call this the good life. I don't know what they were thinking. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, pretty cool. So what's next? Well, we're not done yet. We've got it working locally, but now we need to deploy. So first, you just need to push your code up to a repo. I use GitHub. I don't know anybody who doesn't use GitHub, but if you happen to be one of those people who uses Bitbucket or GitLab, I guess you can use that too. Uh, Netlify supports it, which is great. <laughs> My repo is all ready to go, ta-da. And then, this part is, is almost too easy. <laughs> so go to Netlify, sign up, use whatever account you want, um, and they're gonna sh give you some options. So once you log into the dashboard, you can connect directly, wow, this video is so slow, <laughs> you can connect directly to GitHub or GitLab or Bitbucket, search for your repo, and from there, look, it's literally just this button, deploy site. Like your site's gonna be live within seconds, they weren't lying. So it, they've made it really easy for anybody to do. Whoa, really? You're, that's when you're supposed to be like, whoa. <laughs> yes, really, it's that easy. I feel like an infomercial right now, except without like the cocaine backstage or something. <laughs> So, at this point, you guys really liked that one, okay. <laughs> at this point, you can customize your deployment. You can choose which branch to deploy, add environment variables. You can see I've added the dark sky environment variable down there. You can also do a lot of this from your netlify.toml file. Um, and it's good to know that anything you put in that Toml file will supersede any setup you, act, you do on the actual Netlify dashboard. Uh, at this point, you can also add custom domains, redirects, collaborators, free SSL. Who doesn't offer that anymore? Keep track of your usage. You can see how popular Snowmaha is. The, from that one time I posted it on Omaha subreddit. So, very popular is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> And there's so much more. I, I haven't shown you everything. Um, Netlify has some other great features. They have great documentation. They have a command line interface. And I hope I've given those of you who are struggling to build dynamic sites a better option and an easier way to get up and running really fast. And so now it's time to review. So our problem, cross-origin resource sharing, that asshole, isn't really an option on a static site. But you need those adorable kittens to show up on the shop's website. So now you just need to write some function code using node.js. It's not that bad, I promise. And that reaches out to, let's say, like the pet finder API. And then we configure that as a Netlify function. Now use the, fun, the, fetch, option, the fetch call on, the, on your index page to reach out to the API endpoint that Netlify set up for you. That API endpoint Netlify setup triggers a Lambda function on AWS that talks to the API on the server side for us, and then it gives us a response back. So success. You're not going to have to manage, uh, manually manage scaling if for some reason the site has a sale and all of a sudden everybody wants to know what hours are open. You're not paying for extra resources for servers you're not using most of the time. You're not worrying about security patches. And your client's not going to stumble on an admin, pan an admin panel and fuck some shit up. So Netlify Functions manages everything for you. And after that, you've got kittens populating your page. 
your client's happy, and you get 20% off cat apparel for the rest of your life. So, whoa, pretty, pretty good deal. So uh, I want to thank Trevin. Trevin Hetzel is a friend of mine. He, uh, he shared his open source snow library with me and also helped me implement it and altered it to my taco emoji needs. So he he's, should be here somewhere. Thank you, Trevin. And uh, you can find my slides on Speaker Deck and my repo on GitHub. I'll be tweeting links out later. If you would like to see Snowmaha in action, you can go to snowmaha.com. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask in person or on Twitter. My handle is Hobart Nashery. And with that, I am done. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you.